In today's video, we're going to take a look at the occupied bandwidth of a CW, or Morse code signal. Now, ignoring some of the secondary effects, such as chirp and phase noise or composite noise of the transmitter, the two primary things that are going to affect the bandwidth of a CW signal are the speed that you're sending, or the words per minute that you're sending, and the RF rise and fall time. Now, most transceivers give you, know, give you full control, obviously, over the speed that you want to send, but most transceivers do not give you any control at all over the RF rise and fall time. That's interesting because this has a pretty dramatic effect on the occupied bandwidth. Now CW is really just an extreme case or an extreme form of amplitude modulation or just turning the carrier on and off. Now with any AM signal the occupied spectrum is essentially the carrier frequency, some energy at the carrier, plus upper and lower modulation sidebands. And the sidebands are basically just copies of the spectrum of the baseband. So if it was an audio uh, spectrum, then you just have the audio spectrum on either side of the, the carrier. Now for CW, let's consider the case of just sending a series of dits. Now ideally that would be a square wave if you had a, a perfect uh, weighting ratio. Uh, in most cases it's going to be a little bit off than that, but for our purposes, considering it as a square wave will be fine. So if we look at a square wave in the time domain, in the frequency domain, you're left with essentially signal uh, energy at the fundamental, you know, one over the, one over the period, and then energy at the third, fifth, and seventh, and, and so on, odd harmonics. If you are not quite 50% duty cycle, you will get energy at the even harmonics as well, and that's okay. But let's just consider the ideal case here for the moment. Now the number of harmonics present and the rate at which they fall with respect to frequency is fundamentally controlled by the rise and fall time of that signal itself. The slower the rise and fall time, the faster these harmonics fall off and the fewer of them that you have. So as you can see, a very fast rise and fall time would lead to a lot of bandwidth of the baseband signal and therefore a lot of bandwidth occupied in our CW signal. So in a very general sense, our CW spectrum is going to have energy at the carrier and then an upper and lower sideband, which are copies of that spectrum we just looked at. You know, the, the odd harmonics and with some content of the even harmonics as well on either side. Now, of course, again, how fast those harmonics roll off, therefore how fast these sidebands roll off, uh, really determines the bandwidth that we have and is going to be dictated primarily by speed, which is going to dictate the spacing of all these components of the upper and lower sideband, and then how fast they drop off. So let's take a look at how we're going to test this. All right, so I'm going to primarily do the testing using a signal generator. That will allow me to control both the word per minute keying speed as well as the RF rise and fall time. Again, a parameter we typically can't control with a transceiver. I'll be using a string of dits, which will give me basically a 50% duty cycle square wave uh, of the RF output, if you will. And I'll use a scope to look at the time domain so we can measure the rise and fall time of the RF signal as well as the frequency domain to look at the occupied bandwidth of the spectrum. And we're going to look at uh, a couple of different word per minute speeds and a couple of different RF rise and fall times. And then we'll also take a quick look at uh, one of my transceivers to see how it falls within the results that we capture. So the scope set up here will show the time domain of the RF waveform, which is shown here on channel 1. So we can see the, the dit and the spacing and the next dit here. Uh, the trace below it shows the RF magnitude versus time. We can actually use that to make measurements of rise and fall time. And you can see my signal generator is allowing me to give a, just a perfectly linear uh, rise and fall time to this, which isn't entirely realistic. Most of the time it's going to have some shape to it, but this is how the generator is set up. And then the plot above shows the spectral content of that waveform. I've got it at uh, center frequency of 14.05 megahertz looking at a complete span here of just 10 kilohertz. I've got a measurement bandwidth set up of 5 kilohertz. That's the area inside the blue shaded area here. Uh, that's our measurement bandwidth where we're going to make our occupied bandwidth measurement. And we're going to define occupied bandwidth is how far down do we have to go to for all the signal components beyond that to be more than 36 dB down. And I chose 36 dB because just arbitrarily because that's about 6 S units on a ham radio transceiver. 
So that result is essentially the width of this signal, where everything contained within that width is, you know, higher than 36 dB down. Uh, and then anything outside of that is going to be more than 36 dB down. So it's just our figure of merit. So we're starting off here at 20 words a minute. We can see that gives us a 60 millisecond long dit and a 60, milli long, 60 millisecond long space. We can see our measured rise and fall time for this first test will be 4 milliseconds. This will be the slowest rise and fall time that we measure. And I'll, I'll make some measurements at 2 milliseconds, 1 millisecond, and 500 microseconds. And then we'll make measurements at a couple of different speeds. So we can see now for 20 word per minute, uh, and 4 millisecond rise and fall time, our occupied bandwidth is 200, we're going to round it up, 255 hertz. So I've changed the rise and fall time, sped it up to be 2 millisecond rise and fall time, uh, same 20 word, 20 word per minute speed, and we'd see our occupied bandwidth has increased to 419 hertz. So now at a 1 millisecond uh, rise and fall time, occupied bandwidth is 551 hertz. And now at about 500 microsecond rise and fall time, uh, we're at 651 hertz. So now I've increased the word per minute to 25 words per minute and uh, brought the rise and fall time back to 4 milliseconds uh, rise, 4 milliseconds fall. And that gives us 275 hertz. At 2 millisecond rise and fall, we're at 441 hertz. At the 1 millisecond rise and fall, we're at 645 hertz. And at the half a millisecond rise and fall, we're at 772 hertz. So now I've increased all the way up to 40 words a minute, uh, which is a 30 uh, millisecond dit, 30 millisecond da. Because this is, uh, I believe, the word per minute speed that is used by the WRL when checking uh, keying bandwidth, CW bandwidth. So starting off at the slowest rise and fall of 4 milliseconds, we're occupying 305 hertz. And now at 2 millisecond rise and fall, we're, we're at 505 hertz. At 1 millisecond rise and fall, we're at 835 hertz. And at the half a millisecond rise and fall, we're at uh, 1.036 kilohertz, or 1,036 hertz. I wanted to check one more lower speed, so now I'm at 15 words a minute. I had to change the horizontal scale on the scope so we can see a couple of dits, which are now 80 milliseconds long. And at the 4 millisecond rise and fall, we're at, uh, call that 240 hertz of bandwidth. At uh, twice the speed of rise and fall time, at 2 millisecond now, we're at 340 hertz. Twice again as fast, now at uh, 1 millisecond rise and fall, 414 hertz. And finally, at uh, 500 microsecond rise and fall, we are at 440 hertz. So let's take a look at the results from our instrumented example using the signal generator. Uh, so here's a summary of the results that we just took with word per minutes uh, coming down here and then the rise and fall times here. So there's our table of results. Now it's helpful to look at the plots of these results, but we can look at them essentially in two ways. So this plot here is showing us essentially the occupied bandwidth versus the rise and fall time and the cur each curve represents a different word per minute speed and we can certainly see from this curve that as you go faster and faster in rise and fall time you get a pretty rapid increase in the occupied bandwidth and we can also look at this plot the other way where we're plotting occupied bandwidth versus keying speed and then just have a different set of curves for our RF rise and fall time and again, it's showing the same results, but just in a different way. And we can see that for you know two to four milliseconds rise and fall time, we, the occupied bandwidth even up to 40 megahertz, you know, is still you know well under or about 500 hertz or less. Uh, but as we get faster and faster rise and fall time, that can quickly uh, grow to in excess of uh, one kilohertz of occupied bandwidth. Now as a final test, let's take a look at an actual transceiver. This is my Allocraft KX2 uh, sending a series of dits at about 20 words a minute. Now one of the things you'll notice here is that the keying is not 50% duty cycle. So we can see that the dits are a little bit shy of 60 milliseconds and the period is a little bit longer than 120 milliseconds, which means the actual keying speed 
is uh, just a little bit shy of 20 words a minute right now. Uh, and then uh, we can actually see that the rise and fall time of this transceiver is about 2.8 milliseconds. So that's going to lead to some pretty good bandwidth results. And we can see that the occupied bandwidth of the transceiver is bouncing a little bit between, say, 317, 318, 327, etc. So in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, between 300 to 350 uh, hertz of bandwidth. If we take a look at the Elecraft results compared to our instrumented results here, again we were seeing at about 2.8 millisecond rise and fall time which would put us about here. And if we walk up to the 20 word per minute curve we're in the you know low to mid you know 300, 350 uh, hertz of bandwidth and that's exactly what we measured. If we look at the other set of curves here uh, again at 20 words a minute we go up to uh, you know about midway between the two and four millisecond, we'd be again in that same area, the you know 320, 330, 340 hertz of bandwidth. Now again, keep in mind that uh, the measurement technique that I used here and the figure of merit of occupied bandwidth is likely different than what might be measured by other folks and the ARRL and people like that. But I just wanted to be consistent about how I made measurements here so we can do, draw some comparisons. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it uh, maybe a little bit instructive in terms of how the occupied bandwidth of your CW signal uh, varies as a function of the speed that you're sending and the RF rise and fall time. If you like the th uh, video, please give me a thumbs up. Thanks again as always for watching, and we'll see you next time.